think this is a good opportunity to throw the topic open to our audience. Um, we have roving microphones. We can just about see you here. Um, so if anyone has a question, and if we can see you under the lights, we will come to you. I see no questions at the front row whatsoever yet. <laughs> oh, there's a gentleman at the back there, I think. Um, his hand up there, waiting patiently. I'm going to try and pin you down with some specifics. So uh, 5G is very much about verticals. So let's pick a vertical. Uh, vehicular automation, connected cars, V2X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it has a specific set of challenges. Regulatory challenges, critical infrastructure challenges, um, uh, challenges with performance requirements in terms of the latency needed, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's, 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 it's sort of a key 5G use case, uh, but it has a very specific set of challenges, and it's not a simple one, right? And in fact, um, because of all those challenges, I've talked to some people who said, well, you know, operators will never run any any V2X stuff, it'll all be some kind of a national entity because of all those challenges involved. So let's take that specific use case. How does open infrastructure help unlock that the potential of that specific use case, right? And the business potential of that specific use case for the CSPs? Okay, great question. Um, who would like to um, have, have a crack, Marcel? I'm happy to to have a have a crack, but first of all, I'd say I don't think it's the, sorry, but I don't think it's the best example, because <laughs> there you go. Only because not because only because because V2X is known as one of the things you can actually start with 4G, and other people are doing with ITS, and then build the 5G on top only for that reason. But we're happy to take that example. Um, so what does open infrastructure give to CV2X, and uh, you know? Some, in many areas of uh, the world, especially the UK, uh, there is a huge amount of 4G coverage going on the roads, and it's putting in LTE Advanced Pro features, which are built for mission critical, which are the building block for running a V2X network. So anybody interested in V2X, come to the UK, let's test it out there, there's no better LTE Advanced Pro coverage. So open infrastructure in that sense. You're right, there are operators who are really nervous about that uh, business uh, today. That's why we're doing a lot of trials, and many of those trials are in the, uh, there's a trial called Auto Air on the V2X side, just to get operators and third parties comfortable with, with the, the business model there. But what it really gives is the, so you have networks that run across the roads. You have the NERTS2 network in the UK, which is all about fiber infrastructure across the roads. They're upgrading those fibers, they're upgrading their, their, um, uh, their antennas that they use for their internal use cases. And they're doing a feasibility study now saying, what if we open up that infrastructure, which was always closed, what if we open up that infrastructure to 5G? What does it look like? How can we, be, how can we actually optimize what we do for at a lower cost, but also bring in new revenues by bringing a mix of edge computing? So if you've got you know, 1,000 kilometers of roads, it's a perfect scenario for having edge compute stations, uh, station per, per close, because those are not cities. Those are roads. Those are highways. So you can optimize the, between a mix of edge and being future-proof ready for 5G. You can reduce your own costs, and you can actually get extra revenues by bringing in the third parties on top of that. That can only work if there's a certain amount of interaction, whether that's on multi-spectrum, shared and unlicensed spectrum, whether it's access to the infrastructure on a shared basis and an open basis, and uh, also on the IT infrastructure, especially the APIs for the use cases that mm -hmm. those companies already use. They spend millions and millions of pounds on really legacy you know, systems that they could do better with 5G. So that, that, that would be my answer about what open networks can give. And there's a lot more, but that's just a start. Maybe a, yeah, maybe a comment if you just look at, if you think of, of the scenario where the carrier infrastructure helped the, uh, the automatic vehicle that, you know, having got rid of the borders in, in Europe, right? I live in Grenoble. I would hate that my car would stop at every border that I pass and gr to about, grinding halt. What about Northern Ireland? Having, yeah, having to reconfigure my car. So I think, again, if you look at the opportunity uh, for the telco industry to provide the kind of interoperability that is the reason that the GSMA Association is having an event in the US, right? That to provide that level of openness so a Ford Motor Company or BMW can actually implement across all these geographies and rely on 
uh, companies present in those geographies to handle things like data privacy and all the other things that come in. I think it's a typical case where a lot of what's necessary in terms of culture and capability is in place in, in the carriers, but it needs to be an open uh, environment because otherwise BMW can't deploy across Europe. Uh, so I think that openness is critical for enabling those business models. Great. Um, another question. There's going to be another question. So I'm quoted with Mark Zuckerberg on TIP when I was at Gartner and published on open APIs. And, but I've been through the telco, you name it, ex-Nortel, ex-Manager Networks Engineering at Bell Canada way back. But I've been in the soft switch space back in the early 1999, 2000s. Was chief architect at Siemens on WiMAX, SkyMAX. Also on ATCA back in the day with Intel, Blade Server Architecture. So I've seen a few of these same gyrations. But as we learned, you know, a lot of these things was service assurance reliability, resiliency. ATCA didn't have the complete story. WiMAX was, you know, okay, it wasn't really a 4G, it was 3.5G. Now with 5G, I think we're on the precipice to learn from our mistakes, to learn, you know, how to do end-to-end -end service assurance, how to do NFV the right way. With MCORD, I think there's a lot of potential there. And now it's about connecting the dots. Now, the topic here, open infrastructure. Do you really want to open everything with service, resiliency, privacy, security? Or should it really be open APIs? Because I'm, I'm an advocate about APIs. I don't think you need to give away the source. You, you, you don't need to be on GitHub. You don't need to be on Top Coder with Wipro or whomever. You don't need to share everything because open code means open to hackers, open to, there's always vulnerabilities that we haven't thought of. But open APIs, I think, is the best way. So just any thought processes there. Yeah, I'll take it. Well, <laughs> yeah, just to save Caroline. Um, I'll take it. Um, but basically, yes, I agree. And that, that was the point I was trying to say. It's about what we expose, right? But I want to be clear about open APIs, and if you've been in the open API uh, you know, debate for some time, is that sometimes the open APIs stifle innovation. And this is the point I was trying to make. Sometimes we say that this is the standard, and then innovation comes along and says, well, I don't fit the standard. So I create a, a branch, hopefully to get it back into the standard. So I'm all on for being API driven, but they're not infallible themselves. They're not the perfect answer. I think that, that's what we're trying to get to, what open actually means is, I don't think my experience, the operators are not saying to us, you know, we want to know every bit and piece of your component. No, you just give us the platform. We will tell you how many customers, and if I need an extra charging instance or whatever, just spin it up for me. Get the compute, run it, kill it when I'm done. They want that, and because that's where they see the value proposition is, because then they can go to BMW or, or whomever's running a IT and say, hey, BMW, we have standard APIs to your point, and if you want to talk to us, we can charge you a cent per call or whatever the, 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 the month. That, that's, that's where it needs to go, and I think that's the aspect for open. And I think open to that degree doesn't stifle competition, because continuing the car analogy, you know, the brake is in the middle, the clutch is on the left, accelerator is on the right, if you have a clutch. Um, that's, that's a standard, right? But yet, we have all different shapes of cars. And I'd rather say, as a driver, right, you can have different experience. As an operator, this is what we expose up. We compete on how we do it. And I think open APIs or an API standard is key, particularly for 5G. I think it is going forward, yeah. So if I could just add, so it's an interesting point uh, because you raised some interesting issues there. But uh, I would flip it completely. And in the UK, the trials that are being proposed by the government there with open citywide platforms start with the security. So open doesn't necessarily mean non-secured. You're secure by design. Um, and that is embedded into it. And also carrier grade service quality. So there's skin in the game. So anybody who wants to make any money out of telecoms has got to take a risk where you're offering a service that nobody else can do. If that service fails, you've got to pay penalties. So all of that is embedded into the design. And there are people who are still willing to go ahead. 
And I would just kind of, on one point, there is a perception which is very widespread that open source means open to hacking and less secure. And I think that perception is, is you know, should be challenged because, you know, is it more secure? Is it, is it more open to hacking if it's a closed software development where nobody really knows what the source code, you don't even know if that source code is what you have um, in, um, in your actual network? And there are too many of those cases which are popping up and down and everybody's had them, which means that in many cases, now people are realizing that actually the open source environment for development, which is then hardened and secured by design, is actually an easier way to be sure of what you have there than a non-open source or a proprietary software. So that perception is, 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 is being challenged now. Well, uh, Klaus? No, no I, I think it's, it's also about pooling of purchasing power seen from a CSP. You mentioned ATCA. I think it's a good example that when you try to do things in a too specialized way, there wasn't enough purchasing power to really drive the kind of efficiencies. It was too... You know, it was you know thermally inefficient. The innovation was too slow, etc. Because it was designed for a smaller market. We have to find ways that allows carriers to pull their purchasing power and align it with what's going on in the IT industry at large. Exactly. And then it can be open and closed. I think if we're going to take it to the extreme, I would like for Intel to publish their chip designs, so others can build an XC. And that is not so different from demanding open source, right? How far do we go? I think uh, Intel might challenge me on the idea they continue to make money at the rate they're doing if that was a requirement, <laughs> right? So I think, and, and, but our, our customers like to see that openness. They would like to have a choice between Intel, AMD, and ARM, and we will make that possible. But be, so we just got to you know, be a bit balanced in, in, in where we demand openness. Any more questions from this side of the, of the room? And we had two from this side. Any, any, one over here? Last chance. Oh, sorry, right in the middle. It's, com it's coming from behind. If it just... So can you elaborate? What do you think is the real exposure? And, and, and I don't know. I tend to agree with you, but you... So, I'm curious about it. Sure. So to me, so, so basically, if you look at Amazon, let, let's pick them. And Google are in the similar. And Azure is in the same. Or Azure is in the same, same boat, right? So what Amazon have done very well is they started off, this gentleman's point, the API layer. And they started off very simple, simple queuing system. And they got it really good, to be fair to them. And then they grew up with that model. So if you look at it, you go to Amazon, you log into a console, you get a certain number of services. It's very well defined. And you, you consume on compute. I think operators with 5G need to go to that, need to go to the point and say, this is our API exposure. If you want a, an automotive slice to manage your BMW car down the motorway doing 100 miles an hour, whatever it's doing. And this is how you interact with our platform. And we will monetize that interaction. So in other words, you know, it's 1,000 calls is $1, whatever we're charging to make a difference. And I think that's where CSPs will add the value. And to the point that panelists made here is that, you know, if you take that and you expose that, then you can actually, it doesn't matter whether you're going to decide it's going to be on the edge, whether it's going to be done centrally, you match your service levels against it. And I think that's where CSPs need to grow up and need to grow up and say, you know what, because the reality is, you know, Amazon Web Services, it's the 600 pound grill in the room. You can't take them on directly, but what assets do I have as an operator? And I think that's where standards come in, to the BMW example moving around the country. We should expose that. I think that's where it needs to go. And if you look, it's interesting, you know, if you look at where telco has come, the question about was NFE a, I won't say a mistake, but was it a challenge? You know, I was in a situation where we were pushing through NFE, in a previous role, and I had my IT team and my technology team. And the technology team were celebrating, high five and got NFE. And my IT guys go, yeah, welcome to 15 years ago. So th there was a big disconnect between the teams, right? And we're high fiving each other for virtualizing. Where the IT guys, well, they've been doing it since the 60s, right, in mainframe. So they're looking going, what are you celebrating? So I, I think when we come above that level, right, really where we need to mature as CSPs or CSPs, is how can we exploit what assets we have? And that, for me, is not necessarily about opening the, you know, Intel's chip designs. Yeah, just publish them on the web. Off you go, right? It's not about that. It's about if you take what Intel done way back, say, here's, here's our x86 architecture. Here, if we've evolved to x64, that's a very, obviously, and to do way more than that. But that's how it evolves. I think that's what CSPs have to do. And that's the asset to expose.